Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to yet another Wildlife Articles video blog. Today we'll be covering a subject close to the hearts of many conservationists, particularly those of a younger generation, a generation who've grown up in a tame Britain, a Britain absent the wild intrigue and vast wildernesses of the centuries past. I am of course talking about rewilding, a subject that is never far from the headlines in recent days. Namely, due to the work of high-profile public figures in the environmental field. Among them, Paul Lister, Chris Packham, George Monbiot and Mark Avery. Usually, when rewilding is talked about in the media, it is associated with large, at times fearsome predators, such as bears, wolves and lynx. Rewilding, however, is a far greater concept. It relates to everything, from the ecosystem as a whole, down to the smallest microbes. So first, it is necessary to define what rewilding is, to touch on its history, and its history in the United Kingdom. In its purest form, rewilding is the process in which we, the dominant species on Earth, seek to mitigate against biodiversity loss and protect functional ecosystems. Ecosystems that absent anthropogenic interference over the years would have remained balanced. The concept of rewilding is in fact not a new one. The phrase itself was first coined in the early 1990s by a man called Dave Foreman, founder of the group Earth First and a man who later went on to set up the Rewilding Institute of North America. The idea of rewilding is based solely on the three keystones of a healthy ecosystem, at least according to experts back in the 90s. These were cause corridors and carnivores, the recipe for a healthy natural world. Now however, the concept of rewilding has developed into multiple guises, some referring to rewilding ourselves, reconnecting with nature, some sticking to traditional roots, but rewilding wildernesses, and bringing back large carnivores. For the purpose of this video, we will stick to the popular notion of rewilding, that of bringing back charismatic species, species absent from the British Isles for some time that once ran free across our landscape. Given our rather dubious track record of anything remotely ecological in the United Kingdom, you will be forgiven for thinking that the notion of rewilding in our country was a lost cause. This could not be further from the truth, however, and despite our many flaws, we have proven that time and time again, when we put our minds to it, we can successfully bring species back from the brink. Two species very close to my heart, the red kite and white-tailed sea eagle, have both been subject to intense reintroduction programs and are now, thankfully, widespread again, following years of persecution by we humans. Similarly, species such as the water vole, previously extirpated by North American mink, have been brought back in similar ways. Now, in the current day, sand lizards and pine martens are undergoing reintroduction programs. This is rewilding, though it differs from the common consensus that rewilding is solely associated with species such as bears, wolves, and if you've read feral, grey whales. In the present day, however, rewilding has shifted turned its focus towards more ambitious targets, species that have been removed from the British ecosystem far longer. Two recent examples comprise beavers and boar, two species that were once previously utterly wiped out in our country, but now, once again, can be found in our countryside. But even those relatively new to the concept of rewilding will no doubt be aware of the current resurgence of beavers and boar in the United Kingdom, namely due to the intense media coverage both species have been subjected to over recent times. Boar returned largely due to illegal actions, reintroductions by people who could no longer look after pets or did not properly maintain collections. They also escaped from boar farms and are now, in the present day, spreading and consolidating their range across vast areas of southern England, mainly around the Forest of Dean, though populations are said to persist everywhere from Wales to Scotland with scattered sightings from various other counties around the United Kingdom. 
Beavers, too, stem largely from such covert illegal reintroductions. The population in Tayside, for example, that now numbers in at around 100 individual beavers, was reintroduced without the knowledge of the government. Contrary to Bohr, however, beavers have been subject to legal reintroductions, namely in Knapdale in Argyll, where SNH released 12 beavers to assess the implications these ecosystem engineers would have on our native environment. They have also turned up in Devon and in other various other places around the United Kingdom. Both beavers and boar are in fact ecosystem engineers, as I said previously. This means that they have huge implications for additional biodiversity in the areas in which they live, whether by the creation of new habitats by beavers flooding areas of woodland, or by the creation of foraging areas via digging boar. As such, conservationists like myself welcome the addition of these species to our island's fauna. Some, however, do not share this sentiment, and there is a far darker side to the reintroduction of beavers and boar in the United Kingdom, with many individuals meeting their demise staring down the barrel of a gun. Boar are currently subject to a legal culling scheme on behalf of our Tory government, aimed at mitigating their impacts on the area's human population. They are also illegally killed, and a recent case springs to mind of a large male boar's head nailed to a tree in the Forest of Dean in process, in protest, to the continued presence of these large wild pigs in the United Kingdom. Beavers, too, do not get away scoff-free, though it is far less widely publicised due to the legality of their reintroduction in places. A quick Google search can indeed reveal cases of the Tayside beaver population being illegally persecuted by farmers due to conflict with agricultural interests. This raises a number of vitally important questions regarding our ability to look after, to manage and maintain the species that we choose to bring back to the British Isles. One thing I feel we must address now, before we advance with any grandiose pipe dreams of rewilding, is whether or not we possess the tolerance to care for and properly manage the populations we re-establish. Both beavers and boar are for the large part relatively unobtrusive animals. You are unlikely to encounter them during your casual woodland walks. Still, despite their minimal impacts on our day-to-day -day lives, they are persecuted, in the case of boar, extremely vigorously. Combine this with the day-to-day -day persecution of some of our thankfully yet-to-go-extinct native creatures, the hen harrier, the white-tailed eagle, the peregrine, even the fox, and it is clear that we are extremely intolerant towards wildlife. Bearing this in mind, what chance do species such as bears and wolves have, species that will undeniably have an impact on our day-to-day -day lives, whether that be through livestock predation or somewhat scary encounters. Now, and these are just my opinions, I personally do not feel that with so much prejudice and intolerance residing in the British countryside, that species such as wolves and bears will be making a comeback any time soon. It quite frankly would not be fair to release such animals into an area where they are undoubtedly going to be poisoned, shot or snared at one point or another. Some conservationists dispute the conflict of interests between wolves, bears and humans. It is, however, rather silly to deny that such predators will predate livestock, even though there is a surplus of natural food out there. Overpopulated deer or not, if presented with the chance to take an animal, which on the large part is rather helpless, fat and dumpy, a wolf will do so. Would you not? This is something that must be comprehended before we get ahead of ourselves and plan to bring back such big beasts. There is, however, a slight glimmer of hope on the predator front, and this is one that I have read into quite a bit. 
And this is where I have chosen to position myself. Opposing the introduction of bears and wolves until we get our act together and sort out the last areas of wilderness we have left. I do, however, support, fully support, the reintroduction of lynx to the British Isles. Lynx, like wolves, are indeed predators, and there have been cases of, of reported lynx attacks on livestock throughout Europe where reintroductions have taken place, namely in Norway, where sheep are commonly kept throughout the winter in forested areas. The problem there is self-explanatory. Sheep in forests resemble natural prey. Here in Britain, we do not have that problem. We barely have any forests. Unlike wolves, lynx rarely stray from cover, and as such, will reside themselves to our last vestiges of woodland, whether that be the large pine forests of the Scottish Highlands, or areas such as Keeldar Water, one of the proposed reintroduction sites by the Lynx Trust. Numerous dietary studies from across Europe highlight the fact that lynx favour roe deer as a prey. Such studies involve sites such as the Swiss Jura Mountains where roe are equally numerous and lynx are seen to rely up to 80% on this species. In addition to this, lynx have been shown to predate foxes, rabbits, hares and other creatures that we humans deem pests. Does it not make sense then to introduce a predator that will in sense solve our problems for us, ridding us of the need to control dangerously overpopulated roe, or foxes, or rabbits. Lynx have the potential to bolster our economy, whether by protecting crops through ecotourism, and quite frankly, it would be silly not to reconsider their introduction. I do, however, feel it is vital that we be realistic when it comes to rewilding in our country. Certain things are just not going to happen in the present day. Wolves and bears. Where would wolves and bears go in the United Kingdom? We do not have vast tracts of wilderness comparable with Eastern European countries or North America. There is no good burying our heads in the sand and hoping that simply reintroducing apex predators will work out. There is, of course, areas where they could go. Paul Lister has suggested that it, these species be reintroduced onto the Allerdale estate in Scotland, though I personally, and again, this is just my opinion, disagree with this. Of course, such a trial would tell us a lot about how these creatures would readapt to Britain after so many years of absence. But to me, however, fencing off a large area of land and filling it with elk, lynx, beavers, wolves and bears is nothing short of making a zoo. Or a glorified safari park where the public can gawk at these creatures from the comfort of a comfy seat behind the bars. This is not rewilding. Rewilding can wait if necessary. Wolves and bears can wait if necessary. There is a lot more preparation required before such things can happen. I understand that my thoughts don't represent those of many of you, and like many of you, I do want to see these creatures brought back. There is, after all, an inbuilt longing in each and every one of us to experience true wilderness and the adrenaline rush that comes with knowing that an apex predator could be mere metres away. As I'm sure is the case with many of you at home, I long for a truly wild Britain. I long for the return of continental megafauna and long to be enthralled and unnerved in equal measure by the presence of predators in the United Kingdom. Can one truly imagine the howling of wolves resonating across the Lake District or catching a brief glimpse of a brown bear in the Cairngorms? All of this may be possible, albeit a long way in the future. Lynx, however, do it. Do it now. This is a distinct possibility. But until the day that this happens, I, like everyone else must, will wait and assess the facts before 
we rattle in and push for rewilding, absent proper knowledge. Now I'm sure many of you will disagree with some of the things I've said throughout this post, and that's perfectly fine. If any of you would like to leave your comments on the comments form underneath this blog post, I will happily reply and will happily debate the subject in greater depth. Please, 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 please check out wildlifearticles.co.uk if given the chance. The website boasts some truly wonderful articles on behalf of some truly talented authors, many of whom do not get the recognition that they truly deserve. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter or Facebook, the Twitter handle can be found somewhere up here, somewhere I do believe, or simply Facebook Wildlife Posts. Until next time, thank you very much, I'm James and goodbye.